try to remember every week to turn on the little recorder. Uh, this is the way we record the sermons that go up uh, online with just a sermon by themselves. So see me playing with things or wonder what I'm doing. Uh, usually it's, it's that, making sure I don't forget to do it, first of all. And there's a couple buttons to push, so I want to make sure I get them done in the right order. Uh, but I want to talk today about recognizing Jesus and, and what does that mean uh, for us as people of faith. There was a, a man and his little grandson walking uh, along the beach one afternoon. They saw a crowd of people gathered around a man uh, who had been overcome by the heat of the sun, and he had sunstroke. And so the grandfather was trying to explain to his grandson what was happening and uh, explain to the boy. And the little boy uh, looked up at his grandfather and, and he said, Grandpa, I hope you never suffer from a sunset. <laughs> he didn't quite get the concept. Uh, but we want to talk today about uh, sunsets. Now, th there's a place that uh, my family and I go to down at the shore that claims they have the best sunsets in the world. And I'm sure there are lots of places in the world that claim they have the best sunsets. But there's nothing more, nothing more beautiful uh, than, than a, a sunset. The different colors, uh, oftentimes yellows and oranges and reds, and uh, just magnificent. But the sunset, um, when we experience that, when we enjoy that, it leads to darkness. And so oftentimes sunset is, is not a positive thing. You might enjoy it for the moment, but then the sun sets and things get dark. And I think that's what we normally think of, the darkness that comes uh, following a sunset. But uh, the good news is that whenever there's a sunset, there's, it's always followed by a sunrise. Uh, we might not be able to see it because of the clouds and things like that, but every sunset is followed by a sunrise. And I think there's a real simple beauty in the Easter story that we have as our, our scripture reading for today. These two followers of Jesus on the road to Emmaus. I think it shows uh, a great contrast which were, which were so much a part of that first Easter experience. Those followers of Jesus and, and all who love Jesus, uh, they, they experienced a sunset on that fateful Friday that we call Good Friday. The sun went down on all their hopes and dreams. And for them, it was, it was dark. It was dark. They, they were very hopeful. And, and now all of their, their hopes and dreams were dashed. Jesus had captured their imaginations, but now the Roman soldiers had captured him. Jesus gained their, their love and affection and devotion, but now the forces of hatred had, had divided them. Jesus inspired the best in them, but now they were experiencing the worst. Jesus had apparently claimed a victory, but now all they see is his complete defeat. Jesus had stood for the, for the kingdom of God, but the power of Rome was standing over him. Jesus had promised a, a better life, but now is the, the victim of a bitter death. You see the contrast between what happened on that Friday and what we celebrate on, on Easter Sunday. Have you ever experienced anything like this in your own life? Have there been times when, when you have lost your way? When perhaps you're experiencing a sunset when all you really want is a, is a sunrise? I wonder if maybe even what we're going through now in terms of the coronavirus, you know, it seems like uh, for many people, there's a lot of fear, hopes are dashed. You know, things have been going so well. Many people had, had their lives planned out. At, at the church, we had, you know, this calendar. We were looking at all of these exciting things that, that were going to happen from, uh, from movie nights to, uh, to special uh, meetings and small groups and, and all of the things that, that we've been working on for so long. And then all of a sudden, really just a little more than a month ago, all of those things came to a screeching halt. But that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that there still is not hope, that there still is not joy. We just experience life in a different way. And, and so if I'm speaking this morning to someone who, who's facing that fear, who's someone who is facing uh, these challenges, someone who maybe wants to, to say, you know, where is God in all of this? You know, I think the Easter story 
is for is for those folks. It's, the Easter story is for for all of us. It speaks to us. It happened on that first Easter day. Two loyal followers of Jesus walking on the road to the town of Emmaus, a little village outside of Jerusalem. They were they were going home in defeat and shame and disappointment. They had experienced a sunset. The one who they had been following and had given them all this hope uh, was now, as far as they were concerned, dead and buried. As they walk along, though, a stranger comes up to them. He asks what they were talking about, and they stop, they look at each other, they say, are you the only one who doesn't know what's been going on in Jerusalem these last days? And they start to tell him about this prophet that they knew of as, as Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. He had been put to death. Then they said, but we had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. I love those words, we had hoped. We had hoped. We had hoped. There, there was a, a sense of tragedy in those words, but it's out of that great tragedy that God brought the greatest of all triumphs, the greatest of all victories. Those two followers went on to describe what had happened, how they heard about the women going to the tomb. The tomb was empty. Then some of Jesus' followers went there. Some of his disciples, they went, and they, uh, they didn't see him there. And then the stranger says, the stranger, who is Jesus, says, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Enter into his glory. That, that, that's the glory of Easter, the glory of the New Testament, the glory of the Christian faith, the glory of the Christian church. That's why we celebrate the good news, the good news of the resurrection. Because Jesus stepped into history and he said, this is enough. That's enough. You, you, can, you can have my son no more. I'll have the last word about this. Not even death is going to keep Jesus in the tomb. And so as we, we celebrate today and think about the risen Christ on the road to Emmaus, can our hearts be filled with the glory of Easter? The resurrection, the, the resurrection is a transformation that takes place in our lives. It's a, a transformation that takes place in the way we live. The resurrection changes everything. The stranger, Jesus, walked with them all the way home. He told them so much that they wanted to hear more. Luke tells us Jesus acted as if he was going to go further, but they, they, they challenged him to come. They invited him to come and, and sit down, and they had a meal together. Part of that meal was bread, and bread cheese, uh, Jesus took that bread, he blessed it, he broke it, then he gave it to them. And there was something very familiar in all of that. And then Luke writes, then their eyes were open, and they recognized him. Suddenly, everything was different. The entire situation was transformed. Nothing would ever be the same again. The resurrection has changed everything. The resurrection has changed our world. It's changed our lives. Nothing is the same. I, I saw the title of a book. It was called From Upper Room to Garden Tomb. Instead of lifting Jesus up and putting him on a throne, they put him down in a garden tomb. Those disciples had followed Jesus all the way from the northern part of Israel and Galilee, all the way to, to Jerusalem, down the streets, up to the temple, down in the garden, up to the cross, from upper room, garden tomb. And that was the end, they thought. There was a Sunday school teacher uh, teaching her children about Good Friday, trying to help them understand the meaning of Holy Week. And when she was explaining Good Friday, she said, now this Friday is called what? Good? Good what? And, and a little boy chimed in, he said, goodbye, goodbye. An old Pontius Pilate, the high priest, all the members of the Sanhedrin, that's what they said. Goodbye. Goodbye, Jesus. All the followers, all those Jesus, including these two followers on the road to Emmaus, they were hanging their heads, saying goodbye, Jesus. But their last goodbye was a new hello. It was a new hello for Jesus when he went from the garden tomb around by Emmaus and, and back to the upper room. And nothing has ever been the same. 
Nothing has ever been the same. From that moment on, all those who followed Jesus lived in the power of the resurrection. A transformation, a change took place in their lives. And it takes place in our living, in the way we live our lives. Our living is different because we're no longer the same. We're no longer living under the power of sin and, and death and darkness. We live in the light of God's love, in the dawn of a new day. The sunset is gone, and the sunrise is here. And because of that, the meaning of our lives has been changed. And the resurrection is its more than something that we merely believe in. It's a conviction that takes hold of us. After the risen Christ had revealed himself to those two followers, he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? It was then that they realized they had been in the presence of Jesus. And their thinking was gripped by, by that conviction. And I think that's what we need today. We need great convictions to live by. Lots of people can offer their opinions about different things, but we have to be strong in our convictions and what we believe. There was a church's Easter pageant, and when they did the scene of the, the resurrection, they had a large cardboard box to represent the tomb. And inside the box was a little boy who was uh, playing the part of an angel. And at one point he was supposed to say, he is not here. He is risen. Come see the place where he lay. That was his, that was his line. But of course he got to that part of the play and he forgot his lines. But nevertheless, uh, with all the feeling he could manage, he yelled out, he ain't here. He's done gone. He ain't here. He's done gone. You know, when our thinking has been gripped by that conviction that, that he's alive, then, then we can face anything that comes our way. When our hearts, our hearts burn within us with the conviction that, that, that Christ is alive, we can handle anything that, that we might face, even in these difficult days. And finally, the resurrection inspires our sharing. It, it, it not only changes us, but it, 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 we, can't, we can't that Christ is alive. And that's what happened to these two followers. We're told that they, they immediately, they had already walked the distance to Emmaus where they were heading to, they immediately went back up to Jerusalem. They wanted to share what they had experienced with those disciples who were still there. And they couldn't contain themselves. And the early church was a result of the resurrection. You know, they weren't trying to start a new religion or anything like that, but they couldn't contain themselves. They had to tell them what they had experienced in the presence of Jesus, how they had experienced Jesus in the And so uh, those uh, followers of Jesus went back to Jerusalem. They told the disciples who were there what had happened. And the resurrection was a story that they had to tell. It was a witness that they had to share. Our worship is a witness to the power of the resurrection. You know, whether we're here sitting in our cars in the parking lot or watching at home or checking out the service sometimes later, our worship is a witness to the power of the resurrection. Our Christian living, the way we live our lives, is a witness to the power of the resurrection. Our giving of our lives to Christ is a witness to the power of the resurrection. Our love that we express in sacrificial ways and that we need to continue to find new ways to express that it's a witness of the power of the resurrection. Our words of comfort and hope are a witness to the power of the resurrection. That the resurrection of Jesus has made Christians out of us and our lives are a witness to the power of that. And that's the power that continues to, to sustain us. It gives us hope for today and hope for all of the tomorrows yet to come. On the final night of his life, uh, when the famous preacher Peter Marshall lay dying, he said to his wife as she left his room, I'll see you in the morning. I'll see you in the morning. It kind of sounds a lot like Jesus when he promised, I am with you always. He stands among us even now and promises to meet us even in the darkest of times on any of the roads that we travel. When the sun is shining brightly, when the skies are cloudy, when it's raining uh, the way it is, in the midst of all of our sunsets, Jesus promises a sunrise. I'll see you in the morning. And that is the glory of our faith. 
Do you recognize Jesus? Where do you see Jesus at work in your life or in the world, even today? How will you bear witness to the power of the resurrection this week? Let's pray. Lord, uh, we thank you for uh, the witness uh, that is shared with us through this story from Luke, the witness of those followers of Jesus who experienced his presence in their lives. Lord, help us to experience your son Jesus' presence in our lives. Help us to recognize Jesus and help us to bear witness to our faith, to the love that you share with us, the hope that you bring to us, and the way we live our lives this day, this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.